Good afternoon. Uh, pardon me, saints. Good morning. I'm so used to saying good afternoon for the Wednesday class. Uh, but good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning class uh, in which we are studying the Gospel of St. John. Uh, today we're uh, continuing with chapter 13, chapter 13, which is really an un uh, interesting chapter. We're looking at Jesus washing the feet of the disciples as well as his uh, prophecy of the betrayal of Judas. And also we're looking at uh, uh, Peter's denial uh, as well. He'll prophesy that too. So saints, if you open up your Bibles <coughs> to the Gospel of St. John chapter 13. But let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, give us wisdom to hear your word and apply it. Give us the application, as I said, of applying it to our daily living. And I pray humbly that you would give me accuracy of interpretation and clarity of speech. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So, saints, let's begin. We begin with Jesus washing the disciples' feet, which is ordinarily what is done on some Monday, Thursday, or Holy Thursday uh, celebrations or observance during the season of Lent. Verse 1, chapter 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Saints, as we all know, but just to remind us, the Passover feast was at hand when all this was occurring. And the hour appointed by God had come for the passion of our Lord or the suffering of our Lord. Our Lord Jesus knew what lay ahead. As he said in the text, he was preparing to leave this world and go to the Father. He was preparing to be our Paschal Lamb, our Passover Lamb, whose blood would be used for us to escape eternal death and separation from God. Jesus used the occasion to demonstrate the complete unwavering love he had for all of us, all of his followers a love he would bear until the very end. The timing was crucial, but only Jesus knew how much so. Now the Passover dinner was underway. It would be our Lord's last one with his disciples. And in this Passover feast, he would institute his last supper as the other gospels have already recorded. The devil had been at work. He had worked on Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. Still yet, the Lord Jesus was in control of everything. The Father placed everything into his loving hands. The Lord Jesus had come from God and was returning to God. And heaven's plan was unfolding. It was coming together. And it was up to the Son of God, our Lord Jesus, to see it through. So Jesus, to show his deep love for his disciples and all of us, rose from the table and served them as a humble slave would serve his master and his master's guests. Jesus bent down to wash his disciples' feet. When Jesus rose during the meal to do the servant's job, he called special attention to his ministry and ours and theirs of being a servant. The Lord Jesus had said that the Son of Man had come to serve and not be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This was God's servant, his chosen one at work, 
whom Isaiah had mentioned in Isaiah 42, verse 1. This was God himself who took on the form of a servant of a man and humbled himself even to death, even death on the cross, as recorded in Philippians 2, 6 to 8. Jesus was now foreshadowing his ultimate act of service, the cross. Now verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. You see saints here, Simon Peter, as might be expected, could not sit still and let his Lord and master abase himself so. Peter asked, Lord, do you wash my feet? You're my master and Lord. He told Peter that everything would become clear in time after the events which are about to occur after they pass. Until then, Peter should simply trust his Lord. But Peter was too upset to let it go at that. He said, no, he insisted. You shall never wash my feet. Peter didn't understand what he was saying. Peter didn't understand what was going on. So our Lord responded in a way that he had at other times. His answer had a spiritual meaning. Although Peter kept thinking only of the physical washing, he told Peter he had no part with Jesus if Jesus didn't wash him. You see, our Lord was not talking about really cleaning dirty feet, but cleaning sin-soiled hearts. We belong with Jesus only, saints, when he washes us clean from our sins, and he does that through holy baptism. We must serve, or he must serve us, in order for us to have a relationship with him in which we can serve others. Our Lord didn't distinguish between the physical and spiritual washing. It was the same. But Peter didn't get it. He just focused on the physical washing. Verse 10, Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. You see, the Lord Jesus picked up the thought from Peter's remark. Because they wore sandals and walked on dusty roads, travelers could not avoid getting their feet dirty, could they? A person who had bathed before leaving home, however, needed to have only his feet washed when he arrived at his host's home. So Peter's request served no real purpose. With clean, clean feet, his whole body would be clean. Then Jesus reverted to the spiritual dimension of what he was doing. You see, the disciples were clean. Uh, the disciples, pardon me, the disciples were clean. Their sins washed away by Jesus, but not all of them were clean. One had refused Jesus' forgiveness and was plotting instead to betray him. Jesus knew what was coming. And so he spoke as he did. You see in verse 12 now, he says, When he had finished washing his feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Saints, the Lord Jesus had just completed washing his disciples' feet. 
Then he taught a lesson that all his disciples, including us, can take to heart. The disciples called Jesus their teacher and their Lord, and he was just that. The word Lord in particular in those days indicated that he had authority over them. He was indeed their master. In truth, they saw him also as the Lord of heaven. His disciples needed and still need to serve him. That's why we're called saints from his darkness, from darkness into his marvelous light. But now the teacher and Lord had served his followers in love. He washed dirty feet as an object lesson of the spirit that should typify their attitudes toward one another. A humble spirit of forgiveness, love, and service. They should do as he has done. And that's what we do when we go over backwards to help people. Our lesson still applies to us, or this lesson. It tells us that a true leader is one who serves others. It tells us that a follower of Jesus Christ will act in humble service as their master and Lord just acted. But Jesus called the act an example. I am doing an example for you, a way of representing what he wanted. He was demonstrating the principle of loving service to others. That's what we are called to be, saints. Then he stated the solemn truth, amen, amen, or truly, truly, that servants and messengers, as they were to him, are not greater than the master and sender. Oh, the arrogance of anyone who would think he or she was too good to wash feet to serve others in love. And when you feel that way, you'll feel you're better than the Lord Jesus. Now the Lord says, because we know these things from him, we will be blessed by him when we do them. Now, the Lord moves at this point at verse 18 to predicting Judas Iscariot would betray him. Verse 18, I am not referring to all of you, I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture, which reads, He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Saints, not everyone will share the blessings that Jesus offers through the gospel because not everyone will have faith in Jesus. One of Jesus' 12 disciples had pushed Jesus from his heart and was about to betray him, some think because he had his own private agenda. The Lord knew that. He had alluded to it another time in chapter 6 of John, verses seven and 70 and 71. He knew it would come to this when he chose the 12. We have to remember that our Lord is omnipresent besides being all-knowing and all-powerful. He knows, he does, he sees everything, especially into our hearts. Therefore, he announced that his words of guidance and blessing did not refer to all of them. But if he knew it, why did he let it happen? Well, he chose, he told, he tells them and us. He chose one disciple, even though that one would eventually reject and betray him because it fulfilled the scriptures of God. Jesus didn't choose Judas to betray him. That was Judas' own doing in sin and unbelief. Saints, the one thing the Lord will not go against, he won't go against our free will. He will give us the option to do what he tells us. He will give us the power to do it. But he will not go against a stubborn, hard-hearted will. You see, Jesus chose him because when Jesus would carry out his betrayal, he would fulfill scripture. Judas did what he did out of sin and unbelief. Psalm 41.9 has recorded words that apply to the Messiah. It reads, Even my close friend whom I trusted, Judas, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. 
one who called himself Jesus' friend, would deliver a vicious kick intended to greatly harm him. Judas would deliver Jesus to his enemies. The time had come for those words to be fulfilled now in Christ's life. In all he did, Christ steadfastly obeyed the word of his Father and fulfilled all the messianic prophecies. Jesus told the disciples about it now as another sign to build their faith. When the betrayal happened, that knowledge would help sustain them, the other disciples, against their temptation to despair. They would know the scriptures fulfilled what he had told them. Furthermore, the betrayal would not change Jesus' relationship with the rest of them, nor his mission for them, for not even the gates of hell can, pre can prevail against God's church. He gave them his solemn word that whoever receives anyone who sent him, wait a minute, anyone he sent would actually receive him. And whoever received him received the Father who sent him. The lesson here is that Jesus has continued to send out his disciples to preach and teach the gospel. When others receive that gospel in faith, they receive Jesus. And when they receive Jesus, they receive the Father who had sent him. Verse 21, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciples whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and asked, Ask him which one he means. Who can imagine the grief our Lord felt in his heart as he thought now of his betrayal, of the crucifixion, and the effect the next day's events would have on his disciples? He was troubled in spirit. He stressed, one of you would betray me. He had said it plainly. They could not mistake his meaning. They stared at one another, wondering which one he meant. At the table, John was reclining closest to Jesus, immediately in front of him. Peter caught his attention and asked him to find out which disciple Jesus meant. The author of this gospel never named himself. Instead, when he directly he was directly involved, he called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. From the references and from what we know, saints, from other gospels, we conclude it was John. John's epithet, the disciple whom Jesus loved, gives us a pause. Misunderstood, it might seem arrogant or at least self-centered for John to use it. However, John was not making an exclusive claim on Jesus' love. Every disciple of Jesus is someone whom Jesus loves. Every disciple of Jesus was simply someone Jesus cared for. And John was simply reflecting how much Jesus continued to show him his love as he showed to the rest of the twelve and all of us. John was as close as any of the disciples to Jesus, and he came to treasure Jesus' love in a way that few, if any others, could know. Consider it a humble confession when John calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so can we say that. Verse 25, leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What, he, what you are about to do, do it quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the table understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Following Peter's directive, John looked back and asked Jesus whom he was talking about. 
Apparently only John and Jesus shared this exchange as the others were shaking off the effects of disbelief at Jesus' announcement. Judas too was reclining nearby and Jesus told John that he was speaking of the one to whom he would give a piece of bread after dipping it in the sauce dish from the meal. That was usually a gesture of honor to a guest. Jesus gave the bread to Judas, honored guest, no, but a deceitful betrayer. The move was one, saints, we would call a bitter irony, and yet maybe Jesus meant it was the one final gesture to show Judas the error of his ways. However, Judas had committed himself to evil's way. He took the bread and without apparent hesitation or a hint of sorrow, at that juncture, Satan completed his work on Judas, and Judas took over, and he took over Judas' heart. Then, odd as it may seem, Jesus hurried Judas on his unspeakable deed, but it wasn't really odd. Jesus knew the hour in which he would give himself as a sacrifice for our sin. Jesus took charge to do his Father's will. The disciples did not make the connection with the betrayal, did they? Even John, who knew what the sign meant, hardly knew what the betrayal meant or how soon it would come. They thought that Jesus was directing Judas to go out and buy something that was needed, yet for the Passover feast or give some money to the poor. Since Judas was the appointed treasurer, that would be normal. Judas did move quickly. He took the bread and went out into the night to prepare his trap for Jesus. Now we look at verse 31. Jesus predicts Peter's betrayal. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. John's account omits any reference to the first Lord's Supper, apparently again depending upon the reader's knowledge from the other Gospels. Instead, John turns our attention to the discourse of Jesus, Jesus in the upper room before his disciples, before leading his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, said Jesus, namely with the departure of Judas and the events to come, it was time for the Son of Man and God in him to be glorified. The glory of the Father is inherently bound with the glory of the Son. God sent the Son to become a man, a man as man was created to be originally without sin. As the Son of Man, he was to take the place of all of us, of sinful mankind, and make the sacrifice for all of our sins. Therein lay his glory and the glory of God who sent him. Although it may seem strange for us to speak of Christ being glorified in connection with the treacherous betrayal of Judas, that was the path of glory for Jesus. Only in and through the glorified Christ or crucified Christ can any of us see God's glory and give him glory. The crucifixion itself would obscure the glory only for a time. At the resurrection and ascension, God would bring all his glory to our attention in his son Jesus. Now only a little time remained before Jesus would leave his disciples. Therefore he called them his children. They were as dear to him as children and yet they had only a childlike understanding of what was to come. Jesus had to leave them, and where he went, they couldn't follow. Several months earlier, <clears throat> he said the same thing 
to the unbelieving Jews if you look at chapter 7, 34 and 33 and 34th verses. The Jews, however, would be separated from him <coughs> forever by their unbelief. The disciples would only be separated physically for a short time, the time being. What Jesus had to do now, he had to do alone. And that's recorded in Isaiah 63, 3. As a parting legacy, the Lord gave his disciples a new old command. Moses had told the people already that Yahweh, or I am God, required them to love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19.18. The word near, new here means fresh and having new quality. Jesus' command was to love one another as he had loved them. From that night on, Jesus' disciples were to practice love in the light of of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for them and all of us. That love we call agape. It sacrifices for others. Saints, how will people know we are disciples of Christ? We will practice that kind of love for one another. And now our final verses. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Saints, Peter still didn't understand Jesus, did he? He says, where are you going, he asked. And Jesus answered that the separation was only temporary. They couldn't follow him then, but they would follow him later. What so with soldier-like loyalty, Peter persisted, why can't I follow you? I will die for you. Ironically, our brother Peter, in ignorance, begged to do for Jesus, what Jesus was about to do for him. But oh, what a difference. Peter's boast was brave, but he wasn't beyond playing the coward. And Jesus knew what would really happen and warned Peter solemnly, this very night you will disown me three times. The cocking crow will witness it. You say you would die for me, but when it comes down to it, you will not, not now. When we envision Peter speaking so boldly and then imagine his cowardice later that night, each of us must feel a twinge. We recall perhaps a number of times when we had bold intentions for Jesus that melted into cowardly denial when we were tested. The cock crows for us too. I think, is it uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway? Although it may have been uh, William Shakespeare who said, oh, I think it is from the raven, Edgar Allan Poe, for whom the bell tolls, the toll the bell tolls for thee. So saints, here's where we leave our lesson for today. Next Sunday, we'll come back. We'll start with John 14, where our Lord comforts his disciples. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Keep you in his peace. If you can't.